Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to our webinar, uh, Building Higher Performance Youth Programs in Clubs. My name is Zoe Mile, for those of you who don't know me. Uh, and I do just want to note before we start, if you have technical issues throughout the webinar, my email is in the chat. And so try to reach out to me and we'll try to fix um, whatever's going on. I do just want to go through a couple of housekeeping items and then I will introduce our panelists here. Uh, as I just mentioned, the webinar will be recorded and we're going to share the recording afterwards so that you can watch it again and re, uh, rethink on what we discussed. The second thing is you are muted now and we ask that you do remain on mute just while you're listening, just so that everyone can uh, hear the content clearly and without disturbances. Uh, however, if you have questions, please feel free to use the raise your hand uh, function on Zoom if you know how to do that, or feel free to just type it in the chat. We'll be monitoring that as well. Uh, we will be using breakout rooms for this webinar, for the second half of this webinar. So first we'll have uh, a couple of presentations just to lay some basic content, and then we'll be dividing you into breakout rooms to further share knowledge and discuss. Uh, so if you've never used breakout rooms before, Basically, what will happen is I will uh, assign you to a breakout room and you'll get a little pop up saying you're being breakout rooms are open, you're being sent, basically. Uh, and I think it will either take you automatically or you can click uh, accept and it'll move you there. Uh, I'll be moving the moderators. We have four panelist moderators uh, here with us today throughout the breakout rooms to help and aid in the discussion. Uh, and then when we are done the discussion time, uh, I will basically bring you back to what we're calling this the main room. You'll get a little prompt that will say uh, breakout rooms are closing. If you can either hit uh, go back to main room, or if you don't, they'll just automatically bring you back uh, within 60 seconds, I think it is. So um, that is the boring part. <laughs> and now it brings me uh, great pleasure to introduce our panelists, presenters, moderators this evening. We have first uh, Heather Ross McManus, if you just want to wave hi, Heather, for everyone. Uh, she, her first time position is the High Performance Director with Freestyle Ontario. She was an athlete on the Canadian trampoline team for over 15 years and finished sixth at the Athens 2004 Olympics and is now a coach and master coach developer for both gymnastics and freestyle skiing. Uh, she is joining us today in the position as a long-term development advisor for Sport for Life. So we're very excited to have Heather with us. Uh, next is Sean Riggs, who some of you may know. He is the former... National Recur Coach for Archery Canada. He also started out as an athlete, uh, earning, I believe it was a silver medal at the 1999 Pan Ams in Winnipeg, Pan Am Games. He's got many years of experience coaching as well and leading teams to international competitions. I think the most recent one is the Olympic Games in, or the maybe the biggest one is the Olympic Games in 2021 in Tokyo. He was also part of the team responsible for bringing the Archery Canada Center of Excellence to life in Cambridge. Most of you, I'm sure, are aware of that. Uh, next, we have Don Grosco, who's a coach and a club administrator, and I should also say, and an athlete. Um, but she basically, op she mostly operates out of juniors, Jimbo's Junior Archery Club in Calgary, Alberta. So we're happy to have her all the way from out there. She has coached, I think, basically at every level, international, national, all the way down to local level competitions. And Don, correct me if I'm wrong, your most recent international one was the 2023 World Archery Youth in Limerick, Ireland. Is that correct? That is correct. I got my historian facts down a little bit, yeah. Uh, and then finally, last but not least, we have Kelly Chambers, who sits um, alongside Sean, I should say, on the coaching committee for Archery Canada and is involved at, uh, I think, almost all levels as well, too. She's uh, she's located in the Hamilton area, and she's also been uh, certified as an archery judge so to help officiate at many Archery Canada competitions, I think just recently and some over the summer as well. Um, so we're very thrilled to have all these panelists here, and I will now be handing it over to Heather so that she can get us started here. Unmute. Okay, I think my screen is visible now. Is that right? Okay, good. <laughs> all right. So um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, and I am not going to spend a lot of time, you know, I can never remember how to, oh, there, change my slide. Okay, um, as uh, as Zoe mentioned, my background is, is not in archery. It's uh, trampoline as an athlete and now freestyle skiing as a, as a sport leader. And um, 
I think, uh, you know, I like to share a little bit about where I come from so you kind of understand wh where my perspective comes from. Um, and uh, I, you know, like being involved in sport and, uh, you know, lifelong athlete, I think of myself as I like learning new things. Um, and uh, I've, I've enjoyed sort of getting involved in a new sport as a beginner, as an adult in, in snowboarding and then freestyle skiing as well. Um, but I think there's sort of some common things across all levels of sport and uh, that are really important to me and they align really well with um, the Sport for Life Society uh, quality sport uh, messaging. And so I found uh, Sport for Life a number of years ago and uh, worked my way into um, being a long-term development advisor, uh, working with um, lots of different sports, trying to um, find ways to improve sport at the mostly competitive and, and uh, you know, I'm pretty passionate about high performance sport and but that high performance sports should be good for every athlete and every human involved in it so um that's sort of one of my uh one of my pa most passionate messages that you'll probably hear come through uh today so my first uh slide i just have a question for you and you can actually type in the chat you can find the chat i think at the bottom it's on my screen it's at the bottom um and just what you think in like three words or approximately three words. What do you think draws athletes into high performance sport? What, what makes them want to be there? Um, and so you can just uh, take a second and think about that and type a quick little note in the chat that other people can see just to get the ball rolling. Uh, oh, I can't see my chat, there we go. Okay, so I'm seeing some good answers coming up already. So competition, people like passion, dreams, challenge, mastery. Oh, I'm loving this. This is going to align right with our presentation today for oh, what's coming up. Success, notoriety, ooh. <laughs> connection, challenge again, drive, friendship, awesome. determination, opportunity, accomplishment, Sometimes outside things like uh, requirements for university, it looks like travel. We got travel, that's a good one too. Awesome, and I, if you're still typing, please feel free to keep going, uh, adding out other ideas there as well. I'm gonna switch to my next slide, but that doesn't mean you have to stop thinking about that. Um, there we go. So, um, I, with Sport for Life, uh, my, you know, Sport for Life is a pretty big organization, but uh, I'm involved with the quality sport division, which um, is really more working with NSOs, PSOs, like the, uh, the sort of competitive Canadian competitive sport uh, side of things or the sport pathway that might lead into. Um, so I tend to talk more about athletes, uh, you know, their participants uh, uh, in sport that are interested in sort of uh, moving into competition, challenging themselves at a higher level. Um, some of the things that we talk about in Sport for Life that um, make quality sport are good programs, good people, and good places. And so we're going to dig into that a little bit more uh, today as we get going with the, the webinar. So in terms of what, what is a good program, um, part of the idea is that it is participant centered around the, the human that's doing, doing the sport. Um, a lot of times people say, oh, participants, that's coaches, judges, officials, everybody's a participant. And yes, that's true. So we do want all of those people in various roles to have good experience in sport. Um, and I think one of the things that really drew me to Sport for Life in the first place was the idea of, of sort of athlete centered sport, not that it has to be an athlete in a, in the sense of high performance, but that the person doing the sport is why we do it. It's all about the human. Um, that good programs are also progressive and challenging and designed with planned and meaningful competition. So competition contributes to that positive quality sport experience in a, in a meaningful way. Uh, good people is, uh, you know, that includes your coaches, officials, instructors, it includes also knowledgeable parents. So, you know, talking about some of the things that we're going to talk about here today as you're building your programs and, and trying to improve your sport programs, often bringing parents along on that ride and sharing philosophies is a really important part of that. Uh, supportive partners and responsible leaders uh, are all um, part of that good people side of things. 
And then good places. And I think, you know, it, sometimes we think of places as just the physical environment, and that can be a really big part of it, like a place to train um, but, and, you know, proper equipment or, or terrain or facilities or, or that sort of thing. Um, but it's also the environment. So like the welcoming, the fun, the, the fairness, the, the sort of culture of your sport is part of the place side of quality sport. So I'm going to sort of get back to, you know, a little bit of, of where I'm coming from and, and why I align with Sport for Life and what I, you know, why I'm most passionate about. In my opinion, um, having been a high performance athlete, performed sort of at the top of my own sport and then trying to help other athletes now in different sports perform to the best of their abilities is that sport should make your life better. So to me, that's a non-negotiable. Um, we live in, a, in an amazing country. We have, we're very fortunate to, to kind of have all kinds of options open to us here in Canada. And, you know, there's no reason that sport needs to be a sacrifice. We don't, we don't have to use sport as a way out of, of, of a terrible life or things like that as, as maybe in other places in the world that it might take that role. In Canada, sport, you know, why do sport if it's not, contributing to your life in a positive way. Um, so in the short term, what that looks like is like positive sport experiences, and that replies to everyone at every level of sport. So whether you're, you know, um, an athlete, you know, trying to get to the Olympic Games, or whether you're a first time person trying a new sport, um, you know, and trying to see if you like it, that positive experience of participating in sport is, is sort of that short term piece of that making your life better. And in the long term, uh, it aligns with this idea um, from Sport for Life that's a, a pretty foundational one, which is excellence takes time. So this idea of long term development and, and um, having a positive, um, well-rounded, holistic sport experience over the long term. Again, that makes your life better overall. Uh, some of you hopefully are, are all of you are probably familiar with this, um, the rectangle from Sport for Life. This, uh, you know, outlines some of the stages of development that participants and athletes go through as um, they, you know, work their way through their sport experience. So this is sort of the long-term development model for sport and physical activity. And it's generic to all sports. And a lot of sports have taken this then and made some, you know, sport-specific um, additions or, or details and added to it. I think something that's really important here is like, as you move through the stages, they are um, developmentally based. So as, as um, children grow into adolescence and grow into adults, um, there are some, you know, characteristics that we have a, a, at each stage of development that are important to respect and understand when we're leading sport. Uh, another one is the role of competition. So, you know, while, you know, growth is maybe not something that we uh, can change or control, we're more, you know, respecting it and learning about it and making sure that everyone's included. Um, role of competition is kind of a choice for um, participants in sport. They may choose to follow a recreational pathway. They may choose to, um, you know, sample competition, may choose to continue to, to try to move up to higher and higher levels of competition and perhaps pursue podium performances in the long term. Um, but at each stage of development, that role of competition um, should be you know, in line with the goals of, of the human involved um, and in balance with a positive sport experience. So coming back to this idea of quality, um, quality sport for long-term athlete development is, we, we talked about good people, good places, good programs, but it's also developmentally appropriate. So, so aligned with that human development and growth, uh, it's safe and inclusive. And that's a, obviously a big topic of conversation in the world and in sport today. Um, and that it's well run. And so leading to individual excellence and optimal health. And then another um, key, oops, where did I, oh yeah, sorry, I skipped ahead a little bit. Another key part of that is that sort of inclusive, accessible, ethical, um, and then that, that priority on sort of long-term long -term success, not just in sport, but in life over short-term, you know, sacrifice or, or um, win at all costs kinds of approaches. So, you know, I asked the question earlier about what draws athletes into higher level sport and, and competition. Um, my next question, and you can add to the chat now as well, is, is what contributes to athletes staying and thriving in high performance sport? So again, like one to three words, um, if you need more, that's okay, but uh, you don't need to write a paragraph. 
um, what what is it that that keeps them there? What what makes sports somewhere that play that people want to be and want to spend their time? I see some answers starting to to come in. So self fulfillment, acceptance. Um, actually, that uh, the one, acceptance is an interesting one. It's something that. Uh, at a, a recent presentation, um, one of the Sport for Life summits uh, last year, you know, we were asked to think of what we believed was the fundamental, most important thing about about what we believe sport was. And then, you know, and I'm thinking, okay, like, you know, to to learn, to grow, to you know, and and then the woman who was presenting said, "What if you're completely wrong? What if it's the opposite?" And I thought, wow, like, what if it isn't to grow, to learn, to change? What if it's to be accepted? the way you are so that then you can build on it. Um, so that I like that idea of acceptance as well. It's something that I've thought a lot about recently. I see community, friends, challenge, success, um, competition goals, like having something to, sh to aim for, to strive for, um, having fun, awesome success with like-minded individuals. And I think that's uh, something we see a lot is like sort of finding your, finding your people, right. Um, with that, that think like you that have the same kind of intensity that, uh, that share some common interests and goals, a passion for the sport. Awesome. Okay. So then um, this next diagram uh, comes from Dr. Amanda Visek, who call, she calls herself the doctor of fun and uh, Sport for Life had her as a keynote speaker at a Sport for Life summit uh, three or uh, maybe five years ago now before COVID. So it's a while. Um, and this is this comes from her research in the area of what actually are the determinants of fun. So what makes some makes sport fun? So her research was in sport. Um, and she talked to um, lots of youth athletes and asked them, you know, what, what, uh, basically what made sport fun for them. And when she organized all of her answers, these were some of the categories she came up with. And there's there's a lot more detail in her academic article, but this is kind of the the uh, overview version, um, looking at sort of four different categories where we're seeing some of the things that people said in the chat, actually, where we see belonging and membership, that sense of acceptance. We see self-improvement, that striving, learning, having goals, um, trying hard. Uh, joy of movement, just the the passion or the love of what you're doing, that that sort of, um, you know, that concept of, of flow experience where you, you know, just the movement itself gives you joy. Uh, supportive environment, so that, you know, that the those good people, the positive coaching, the role models, um, and that, you know, we, we talked about good places, but also that's that culture. Um, and we we see those things in uh, you know how they're carried out can be things like like swag, team uniforms, um, you know something, team rituals, cheers, um, friends, and and traditions that they might be developed in sport. Um, I think something that's kind of um, you know a lot of times when we uh, hear people talking about sport and we we talk about high performance or we talk about recreational and we hear people say fun or competition, fun or high performance. And it's one of my biggest pet peeves in sport is when, when we talk like that, because I think um, it's, it's not one or the other, right? It's like trying hard is fun. It might not be fun for every person. Some people might find trying hard really, really, really fun. And other people might find, you know, the, the team rituals and the, the games and the, those things more fun. So different people are going to sort of have slightly different, preferences and what they find most fun or enjoy most about uh, um, different levels of sport. Um, but it, I think it's important to kind of be conscious of letting go of that either or and that competition doesn't have to just be serious and boring. Um, it can be something that contributes to a real um, sense of enjoyment and joy. So next slide. Um, I think this this one, I, there's a fair bit of information here, but it, it came from a sort of a, a bigger study on sort of looking at why long-term development and this quality sport approach is fun. And this is sort of maybe looking at the negative side of what we're trying to avoid or what we're trying to, um, you know, build athletes up to be able to move beyond some of the things that can be negative or can be reasons that sport might not be a, a good experience or might where that get in the way of those positive sport experiences. So things like injuries, depression, um, you know, disordered eating, 
um, harassment and abuse and inequality, um, maltreatment, bullying. Um, these are things that are, you know, the things that we basically want to do the opposite, right? We want to prevent, we want to move um, forward into the positive side of sport. And I think sometimes, you um, it is important to recognize that those of us who love sport and have had, you know, primarily good experiences or have found our way to creating positive experiences for it for ourselves and others. Um, I, it's, I think it's important for us to still keep in mind that sport is not automatically good, that it's something that we consciously have to create, choose, um, build in, in uh, you know, even our small choices every day, the words we use, um, the way we set up our, our programs and our drills and our leadership. So then looking at sort of the flip side of that, um, you know, the, the what, what do we want? Um, and I think one of Sport for Life's, um, you know, really non-negotiable things is is this idea of inclusion. Inclusion is non non-negotiable, and this can look different, you know, at every stage of development in each person's sport experience, in different sports, in different, um, you know, uh, situations. Uh, and so, some of the things to take into consideration when you're thinking about, you know, creating an inclusive environment is often when we start looking toward higher and higher levels of performance in competition competition, we think that now inclusion doesn't apply sometimes, or we get we get stuck in this pitfall that inclusion is for participatory recreational sport. And then once we get into competition, it's elite, and we don't have to worry about that as much. But really, in fact, if you look at all of these things, these, these are these are human um, realities that affect everybody at every level of sport. And so, you know, making sure that we're um, aware of, of the impacts of um, you know, choices we make, how we build our programs on, you know, gender, on age, are we being um, ageist or, you know, excluding people, pushing them out simply because of age. And then, uh, you know, sexual identity, culture, religion, uh, ability levels and, and uh, race, ethnicity, uh, socioeconomic background, all of those things um, apply in high performance as well. So as we build high performance programs, we have to make sure to not let go of those values that, that we have at all levels of sport. And I think this diagram lends itself well to that idea. So, you know, this, this is, um, when, when we were discussing with the sport for life advisors and, um, building the LTD 3.0. So the third version of the long-term development framework for sport for life, um, we looked at this diagram and we, you know, we had a lot of discussion around how linear it is and how, you know, really it, you know, we, we have these categories that helps us understand, but really people move through them in a lot of different ways. And it's really hard to show on a flat piece of, you know, rectangular paper. Um, and so this is kind of the result of, of, you know, the group's thinking on this was uh, Colin Higgs, who's also a sport for life advisor, um, came back with this, uh, which we, we started calling a spaghetti diagram. But the idea behind this is that Athletes are not necessarily going to move easily on a linear path from, you know, grassroots through to high performance without, um, you know, different decisions, roadblocks, things they have to challenges, setbacks, maybe even, you know, just choices that they make that I ah, maybe I don't want to do this and then they change their mind and they want to come back to it. Um, so keeping that in mind, I think, is a big part of that being inclusive and helping each individual athlete find their way through sport to reach their own goals and have that experience, positive experience that contributes to their life. Uh, and so the other thing that um, it's sport for, so that, that kind of comes from the, the framework, the long-term development framework. Sport for Life has also developed some really um, detailed um, information in about, that's called the athlete development matrix. And most sports have then taken that and made their own sport specific version. So on the sport and technical skills side of it, they, you know, most sports will add um, our own technical skills and technic te technique, tactics, skills, that sort of thing. The physical capacities obviously are going to be, you know, some of them are really um, multi-sport and can apply across a lot of sports and other ones are really sport specific. Then the psychological or mental skills, um, we've, we've sort of come around to in the update thinking of this as feeling, thinking and doing. So um, your emotions, your, you know, the psychology of sport, uh, 
and uh, how you implement that. And then so behaviors and actions as well. And then that community connections and life skills uh, quadrant is the other other category. And by you know making sure that as we build, as we go through the stages and build programming at different stages of development, that we're taking into consideration all of these four quadrants um, in terms of what goes into athlete development um, for a holistic holistic athlete experience. So I, you know, sort of jumping from concept to concept and the idea is that I'm giving, you know, I, I was taught, you know, when I was talking to Zoe about what, what was important and what we were, where were we going to go with this webinar, um, some of the, the things were, you know, trying to engaging people, keeping youth involved, you know, encouraging, making high performance a positive experience as well as, you know, you know, successfully uh, helping them reach their goals. Uh, and so, um, this one is something that actually comes from a researcher in the area of ADHD, but he's um, this concept of uh, engaging that connection. You know, each of these things is part of sort of the, the experience, quality sport experience. And his research is not necessarily just in sport, um, but at Sport for Life, we've been taking a look at this as a way to think of um, making sure that people are getting what they need out of sport, that human needs are being met. And so, and that's not excluding mastery. You see mastery as one of the bubbles there. Um, and, you know, so high performance and elite performance of coding performances are not, you know, are, are not given up for this, but that, that win at all costs or, um, you know, uh, focusing only on performance um, is, I think we've learned over the, the last years that that is not really a healthy way, even for someone who is a top performer to live their sport experience. So including that connection, including play, even at a high performance level, um, practice that opportunity to learn and to try and to, um, to continue to develop skills, that opportunity to master and, and feel that, you know, perfection or that quote, like, you know, that striving for a, a fine detail. And then that recognition, so those team rituals, the swag, and you can see that these concepts start to overlap with, you know, Amanda Visick's concepts of fun um, and the, this cycle of excellence that Hallowell's put together. Um, and then I just bringing it back to the the um, fun diagram, and you can see sort of some of the the overlap there. Um, and I think uh, that brings me pretty close to the end of my section. Yes, it does. Um, and I think, I'm trying to think if there is, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here. There we go. Um, yeah, so thank you for listening to me and I'm gonna pass it along. I believe Sean's gonna take the, uh, the screen now and, and move things in a little bit more of an archery specific um, thread of thought here. Terrific. Um, thanks very much, Heather. Really appreciate that. And um, thanks for, for getting us going. So um, can everybody see my screen okay? Just a thumbs up or a nod is good. Okay, great. So we committed to doing this webinar quite a while ago and, and said we wanted to have an influence on high performance programs in youth sport, um, specifically archery, of course. And um, so Heather, um, we brought Heather in a little bit later, but Don and, and Kelly and I worked um, behind the scenes a fair bit trying to figure out what we would talk about and how we would connect all the dots. And so I um, really appreciate the input from Heather. And you'll see as we go through the next few slides, how we're kind of taking some of the ideas that Heather gives and, and hopefully, um, well, certainly expanding on them and then making them actionable for you in your training environment. So I'm just going to um, hit the next slide here. And so um, Archery Canada has done a number of webinars over the last 12 months, 24 months, kind of starting in the COVID, at the start of COVID. Um, and we've taken a lot of feedback and, and we just want to let you know that when you give us feedback, it, it does influence um, how we choose to go ahead. So kind of the three things that we wanted to make sure we accomplished for this webinar based on the feedback um, is we heard that everybody likes to hear from people like Heather. So sports experts from outside the archery community. We know you have lots of chance to speak with people inside the archery community. Um, and so there's a general desire to hear from people that have expertise that relates to sport, but maybe not directly in, um, within our sport. Uh, we also heard that people like the opportunity to engage with other coaches. Quite often we operate 
on, in our own little silos. And these webinars, there's a huge amount of expertise on not just, certainly not just from the panelists, but expertise um, from throughout, throughout the room. And so we're gonna do that at the end, like Zoe said, and we're gonna give you a chance to kind of collaborate on, in some breakout groups. And then another key goal that it seemed that everybody had was they, they actually wanted to take something back from webinars that was actionable so that they could, you know, the theory was great, it's one thing, but understanding how it applies directly to their training environment um, was important in the feedback that we received. So that's been a goal for us as well. So hopefully tonight we'll check all three of these boxes. And at the end, if we don't, um, we'd love to have you let us know. Um, so just moving on. So as we started talking about high performance program considerations, there was quite a list that we came up with. Um, these are some of the ones that we were talking about that could contribute to a successful high performance program, um, but we were struggling to get onto a specific to topic. Uh, and then after speaking with Heather and seeing some of the information that she had for us, um, we, we settled on fun. And so you're kind of like, okay, I'm on a webinar for an hour and 15 minutes and we're gonna talk about fun. Um, I think it's really important and you'll see how we get into some detail of it and how it'll be relevant to your environment. Uh, and then I just couldn't let this webinar go without giving a shout out to these two guys, particularly in the context of fun. Um, I'm gonna tear up here, but if you haven't gone and watched um, Eric's matches from the final day of the world championships in Berlin just a month ago, um, you're missing out. And so if you're an archery fan, whether you shoot 3D or bare bow or traditional, please go watch it. I'm here you'll see two extreme examples of fun. Um, Joe is the sports psych that works with the team and has worked with the team for a number of years. And he just shows us absolutely one definition of fun. And then Eric with this sly grin here as he achieves what I think is probably the best result in Canadian recurve archery ever. Um, with a second place finish at the world championships in the year preceding an Olympics. It's such a milestone and it was such an event. Please watch it. I won't say anymore, but please go watch it. So when we talk about fun, you know, why are we going to talk about fun? Because I am without a doubt, there's no, um, there's no more important component of the training environments you run. I'm um, as far as athlete retention, uh, it, as far as athlete retention goes, making sure athletes are having a good time and enjoying themselves is absolutely critical. But then why do we need to talk about it? It's because there's been a fair bit of work that says coaches tend not to understand fun in the same way that athletes understand fun. And this disconnect um, can cause challenges in the training environment. And then even as Heather had mentioned, this idea that fun and performance are kind of um, diametrically opposed is, is a concept that is pretty common. And I think we'll go through and talk about why those two things aren't opposed and how you can leverage them both in, their, in your training environment. So two types of fun. So as we dove in, lots of research, I read more white papers than you could possibly imagine. Um, but really we come down to two types of enjoyment. Uh, and this is broad, it's not specific to sport or archery, but enjoyment's typically broken down into hedonic um, enjoyment or fun. And that is, Kind of, it's it's the things that you think of as a kid. It's the blowing bubbles. It's the playing on a playground. As an adult, it's going to the spa or you know reading a new book or going out with friends. So the things that are fun just for fun's sake. Um, so that's kind of the first part of fun. And then this word that's new to me. So if you can say it better than me, please don't hesitate to correct me. But I'm um, this idea of eudaimonic fun. And what that is is the idea of doing something that's difficult. Um, but because it's meaningful and in, and getting enjoyment and pleasure out of that process. So it's quite a bit different than the hedonic fun. This is really doing something with purpose. And as we kind of go through the list of things, of reasons why athletes participate in, in sport, um, that Heather had you type in it, it does quite align to this. And so I'm, there's been a bit of work, although the science is still a little weak, I'm, but there's been a bit of work that correlates age I'm with these two types of enjoyment or fun. And so the hedonic type uh, is really prevalent among young athletes. Um, but once you start to get to that age of nine or 10, it, it tapers off, it persists, but becomes much less important than this eudaimonic fun. So as athletes get to 11, 12, 13, and, and, and on up, this idea of striving becomes a more important part of enjoyment. So they're more apt to cite this as an important part 
an important part of enjoying their training than they are the things that we count as fun. And this was something that maybe I knew perhaps intuitively, um, but to see that there's been work in the background done and that this is the right way to go forward is really helpful for me as a coach. So then I'm, oh, and one more point. So the correlation here, I'm with, with girls, um, the shift towards eudaimonic fun does tend to happen a little bit earlier um, than it does with boys. But in general, these graphs are for both genders. So kind of taking that idea, um, when Heather showed us this determinants of fun and quality in sport, I was like, okay, great. That's a whole bunch of arrows out of a slide. Please put them in order because I want to know how to prioritize them to maximize my training environment. Um, and so sure enough, we were able to put them in order. And this order might not surprise you, but, but there are some things here that were really interesting for me to find. So being a good sport, that was great. I was really glad to see that that was the top priority. Um, but trying hard, you'll see that aligns with this tendency towards eudon eudonomic enjoyment. Um, but did surprise me that, that athletes were really kind of after this um, idea of trying hard. Uh, positive coaching, that's of course what we're here for and, and we would expect. Um, the next four were pretty closely matched, but again, we see this trend to striving. So learning, improving on um, games, practices, and then only when we get to kind of the last three or four, do we see these hedonic um, kind of types of enjoyment show up and that's team rituals and swag. So these things made the list. So athletes did cite them as reasons why they participate in sport. Um, but in the list of 11, um, they did rate at the bottom. And so again, I'm like, okay, tell me more. Um, and so then when you dive in, you can even, you can go one step farther. And so this is the list, there's 81 determinants. Um, these are the top determ determinants. Um, so I put the top 10 up there. I won't read them. Um, but everybody can kind of see them. There is a tendency towards working together. I'm um, working hard uh, was one that surprised me there. Exercise and being active. Um, that's great to see. And I think sometimes as archery coaches, we maybe lose concept of that. Um, but great. And then these were a few more that were near the top. They didn't make the top 10, but were interesting for me to see. So this one, getting clear, consistent communication from coaches was really important. And I can tell you, hopefully Steph and Brandon will nod, um, that this was a, a really important principle for me to exercise as I kind of um, grew in my coaching over the last six years. Um, so it was good to see it here. And then the other thing that we may lose track of, again, with archery being such uh, individual sport, is this commitment to team. Um, so you see it in number 14 and number 17, this desire to be supported by teammates, um, but also to contribute to supporting teammates. So, you know, really something to think about as we structure our programs and structure our plans. And then the bottom ones. So these, again, they made the list. So they are important to some people, um, but they rate really low. And so for me as a coach, it's great. We can include these. But how much time are you spending taking care of some of these tasks and, and maybe not getting the value out of them? Um, most coaches are volunteer or they do it as a second job. Um, so, you know, we've all got to be really efficient with our time. So when you see things like um, going out as a team or team uniforms rated so low on the list, it then really becomes something that either should we be terribly involved in it or should we be assigning it elsewhere? You know, if we're going to maximize our time as coaches, and these don't pay dividends at the rate as other things, then perhaps we should be either shelving them or, or um, assigning them to somebody else to take care of. But this list, this bottom list for me, I thought, oh my goodness, so much time gets spent on these things compared to the value they give. Um, a few more interesting archery ones, if you bear with me, just a couple more. Um, having parents watch rated a little below middle of the pack. And for some of you, I know parents in the training environment is a challenge, parents um, in the competition environment is a challenge. And so this kind of gives you a little bit of authority to say, hey, maybe you don't need to be here um, because really it's not as important to your child as perhaps you think. And of course, every child is going to be different, um, but it was interesting to see that on the list. And then num number 64, they must not have interviewed any archers for this because equipment was so far down the list. Um, I would expect among archers, it would be a little bit higher. Um, but also nice to see that it's it's not making the top. And then 67, earning medals. 
and trophies. So really great to see that sport for the most part for our athletes is not about that. So, you know, lots of information here and, and Heather certainly gave us lots of information. So I just really wanted to give you one more slide before we go into breakout groups and, and kind of walk you through how I was structuring as a coach, or how I was thinking about training um, as I got a little bit later in my career and had a little more experience and a little more help. Um, and so to make things kind of super applicable for your training environment, let's just walk through this and I'll, I'll tie it back to the topics here. So we talk about this idea of eudonomic enjoyment um, and that's towards striving and being successful as an athlete long-term. And so if you're gonna structure a practice to really maximize the opportunity there, um, then we need to be conscious of this idea of challenge point. When we were talking about challenge point as a group, everybody was like, no, I haven't heard about that. But as coaches, you probably know it intuitively, but it's nice to call it out specifically. So if you look at this chart here, um, the axis going up is performance. So they're kind of talking about success rates. So at the very top is an is a activity or drill you give your athletes where they're 100% successful. And along the, along the horizontal axis, along the bottom, it's an easy drill, so they're 100% successful. To the far right, it's a, it's a challenging drill, so they have zero success. If you look kind of at that optimal challenge point, it's in this success range between 60 and 80%. So depending on what you look at, um, you'll see different numbers quoted, but they typically come between the 60 and 80%. So in this window is where the athlete is learning the most and retaining the most according to this theory. So as a coach, the more time you can spend in this area where the athlete is successful 60 to 80% of the time, the faster you're going to get improvement, the more the athlete is going to feel that um, sense of enjoyment from striving and success. So I hope that makes sense. And Perhaps we can discuss it in the breakout rooms if it doesn't. Um, the second piece, so when you're planning a practice, making sure you're hitting that optimal challenge point. The other thing is keeping the, the training sessions novel but relevant. So as I go to different clubs throughout kind of my coaching career, the number of times I'd arrive at a club and people would be scoring um, was really high. And if you think about a basketball practice you had in gym class, you played so little scrimmages. There were so many drills and in archery, we tend not to do drills. So finding a way to do novel drills that are relevant to the goals and the stage of the athlete um, in the season and in their competitive career, um, it's, a, it's a real skill to, do, to develop those, um, but it's really important to do that, I found. Uh, and then connecting what you're doing with that novel skill um, with what the goal is for the athlete. So an example for me would be, we would do pyramids where an athlete, a recurve athlete would hold the bow for five seconds, then they'd hold it for seven, then nine, then 11, and then back down. So why are we doing this? So if we're in the strength phase early in the season, it's very clear, this is a sport specific strengthening drill that we're walking, that we're walking through. But then as we got later in the season and I'd introduced the drill, we'd run the same drill a few, you know, at different intervals. But now as you get closer to the competition season, you can explain the same drill, but again, connect it back and say, hey, this is an opportunity to be mindful and really be conscious about where your mind is when you're holding for 11 seconds, because that becomes more of a challenge. But it's relevant again to being late in the competition, like or approaching the competition phase of the training, training cycle. So connecting the drill with what the athlete is working on, again, points to them as to why it's relevant to their long-term success. I'm creating an opportunity for teamwork. It doesn't exist in every environment, but when you're doing that, that pyramid drill to ask one person to time and another to do the drill, or um, in other drills where perhaps you're training speed to have one athlete scope and one athlete shoot and then switch them off, where you connect the two athletes together and they've got an opportunity to provide feedback and support. I really created some great training sessions. I'm adjusting live time. So I'm one of my favorite things is when my athletes would break a drill. So I'd spend all night figuring out something and creating these rules to this game that was relevant and I could explain and then give them half an hour. They're all far smarter than I am. They'd come back and they'd figured out the loophole. And so when, when we first ran into this, we'd have to change the rules and then people would be like, oh, we're changing the rules and I was winning. But as we got later on, they were like, okay, great, we broke it. 
But now we're going to adjust it to make it more challenging to keep it relevant and away we go. And it became a bit of a joke, at least I hope, um, among the athletes that train with us on a regular basis. Sean's changing the rules again. Here we go. Um, and then the last one is to make sure you debrief because you don't know what impact the drill had against the goals you set. Um, if, if it was at that challenge, unless you're connecting back with the athletes. And from my experience, the athletes would absolutely give you great feedback on tweaks that you could make. And they hated it when they broke a drill and somebody else beat them. So there were always modifications that they would give that would enhance the training session. So when we look at this idea of eudonomic enjoyment, um, this is kind of one of the things I would look to incorporate in structuring a practice. Um, so that you're able to leverage these athletes' desire to strive, which then leads to enjoyment, which then leads to their longevity of the sport. Great. So, Zoe, if you'll come back in now, Zoe is going to manage our, um, our breakout rooms. So, thoughts for breakout groups, and we're going to leave this slide up. When you go to your breakout group, this slide will be up too. Um, we really want to take the opportunity for coaches to connect. So there's no homework here. We're not going to bring you back and say, group one, you need to tell us this, and group two, you need to tell us this. This isn't the goal. We do, however, want you to stay solution focused. It's really easy to get in a room and go, oh, this didn't work and this didn't work. It's great it didn't work. Solicit the help from your, from your colleagues in the room to, to stay focused on how you can change um, and what you can do. And then we've pro pro provided discussion questions really with the goal to get the conversation going. Um, what do you think already works in your club from a high performance youth perspective? Where do you think you can make a change, perhaps based on the information we've given you, or perhaps based on something else? What's easy and you can implement right away? And what's a challenge that will be difficult to implement, but you think there's big rewards for? Um, and then if you get through those ones, you can go on and talk about what do you think makes a good high performance program? Um, and you know, in the HP world, kind of like we've talked about today, how can you leverage fun? So I think we set every we told everybody we'd end at 8:15. Um, so Zoe, so we, we want to set them up to go into breakout rooms for 15 minutes, and then we'll bring everybody back with 10 minutes where we can connect. Yeah, and then absolutely. Um, we've uh, we've asked a couple of people in most of the breakout rooms just to kind of make sure the conversation goes. Um, but if at any point you need a hand, you can just call back to Zoe, or if somebody doesn't show up in your group and your group's too small, send Zoe a message in the chat and she can help arrange it. And you're likely to have one of the four of us panelists pop into your group just to um, spark conversation or for you to give us feedback, anything like that at any point. Any questions? Yeah. Zoe, I think I talked through your bit, but over to you. It's all good. Yeah, Sean basically covered it. Um, the first thing I'm gonna do is I am just gonna stop the recording. Um, so this recording will be